You're listening to the Highbridge Podcast, celebrating the people, places, and history of the Highbridge area in Sedgemoor. And welcome along to another edition of the Highbridge Podcast, celebrating the history, people, and places in the Highbridge Sedgemoor area of Somerset. This season is funded by SEED, which is a consortium of community organisations in Sedgemoor, comprising of Bridgewater Senior Citizens Forum, Bridgewater Town Council, Community Council for Somerset Homes in Sedgemoor, Somerset Film and Young Somerset, which is funded and supported by Arts Council England, Creative People in Places, Lottery Funding and the Arts Council. This episode... I'm chatting with Larry Bennett, who is going to tell us all about probably one of the world's most famous radio stations, which was based in Highbridge. Why was it so famous and who listened? Want to find out more? Then listen in to this fascinating chat with Larry Bennett. To start us off, Larry, tell us a little bit about what the radio station was all about. Right. Um, It was... Probably at its time, the world's largest maritime communication station. If you think of today and you pick up a phone, you can speak anywhere in the world via satellite, anywhere, any aircraft, any ships, anywhere in the world you can do that. Back in the 1920s, when it was formed, the only way to communicate with a ship was via radio. And that's using Morse code, of all things. There was no telephony at the time. Everything was in Morse code. So if you wanted to get a message to a ship, you sent a message to your local post office, who would then forward it to the radio station at Highbridge, and then they'd relay it by Morse code to a ship over the radio link. And if they wanted a message returned, the ship's radio officer would send a message back via the radio station, and it would then be forwarded to the destination. And that carried on for 30, 40 years, from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, right up to the 1960s when radio telex came into operation, which made it much easier for shipping companies to send messages direct. There was also radio telephone communication, but that didn't come to Highbridge till 1972. Uh, Prior to that, it was done through a station at Rugby with a receiving station at Brent in Essex and also at Baldock. So basically the station was to let everyone communicate with the ships at sea and vice versa, and that was the whole point. At the time, the British Merchant Navy was huge, one of the largest fleets in the world, and the station was, and probably was even when it closed down, the biggest maritime communication station in the world. In Highbridge? In Highbridge, yeah. The other thing that threw me when I first discovered it was it, it's called Porter's Head Radio. Uh-huh. Yep. In maritime communication parlance, the station is named after the transmitting site. Uh, the station was formed in 1920. The original transmitters were at Devizes in Wiltshire. Uh, that was the site of an old point-to-point station which was converted to army use in World War I. And in 1920, the post office took it over, put transmitters there, and it became Devizes radio station. The problem with that, it was nowhere near the sea. It was a high-power transmitter which was causing all sorts of problems to the receivers in the same location. So what the post office did, they put a receiving station in Highbridge, away from all industry, close to the coast, and then transmitters were at devices, the receivers were at Highbridge, but then in 1926, they moved the transmitting site to Porter's Head, on Porter's Head Down. And that's how the station got its name. So from 1925, it was known as Porter's Head Radio. And that's how it stayed until the bitter end in 2000. So when they, when they moved to actually moved it into Howie Bridge, they, they kept the name and that's why it stayed Porter's Head. Exactly, yeah. Uh, the Porter's Head transmitters closed in the 1970s, but the station was so well known throughout the world, they just kept the name. Even at uh, the closing down time, the transmitters were at Rugby, but the name Porter's Head Radio, so, so synonymous with shipping, they kept the name all the way through. So when did you work there? I was there from 1980 until the bitter end in 2000. So, uh, unfortunately, I never got a job at sea. Um, they preferred seagoing radio officers who knew the business backwards. But the turnover in staff was so high in the 1970s, they took people straight from college, basically, and that's how I managed to get a job. Obviously, there was quite a stiff entrance test. You had to take a Morse test, and you had a year to prove yourself. Otherwise, you were just chucked out. <laughs> so you had to take a 27 words a minute Morse test. 
a French test of all things, which I was exempt from because I had a French show level, and what's called a station walk around. The station manager took you around the station and you had to tell him what every single part of the station did, from basic communication theory to how to power up the auxiliary power supply in case of failures and so on. So that, that would be just in case of emergencies and you were the only person in the building? Exactly, yeah. Uh, the station never closed. It was 24 hours a day, 365.25 days a year for over 75, 80 years. So the, the size of this transmitter, it, it, it must have been huge. Initially, yeah. Uh, at the time, the 1920s, they hadn't investigated shortwave very well. So to increase the range, they thought they had to increase the power. So the divisor transmitters were sort of 10, 15 kilowatt, huge transmitters. But as they developed shortwave communication, which the radio amateurs of the time were quite keen on doing, they found they could cover the world on maybe two or three kilowatts. So uh, back in the day, you'll see pictures on the website, which I'll tell you about later on, of the original transmitters, and they were absolutely immense. And of course, those days, it was all spark transmitters and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, modulation didn't come until later in the 1920s. So when the station originally was was broadcasting and in its heyday, mm -hmm. how many how many ships and how, how much traffic was actually going past or communicating with Highbridge? Oh, immense! Uh, probably at its heyday, we take over two thousand telegrams a day. Wow! <laughs> from uh, probably well over a thousand ships, all in Morse code. So that 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 is also time consuming because you've got to translate it and then put it back and then send it out and then reply and uh, not as bad as it sounds. The good thing about Morse code, it's built up letter by letter, so we can send and receive messages in any language in the world. We used to take loads of messages in Greek, and because it's letter by letter, you didn't even have to understand it. So we'd set their headphones on, a message form in the typewriter, and as he, the guy would send it from ship, we just type type it in letter by letter on the typewriter. Once that's done, we check it out, count the number of words, make sure there's nothing missing, and then just pass it down the belt to be sent off by telex or telephone. It's a, a completely different world to, to how it is today with just pick up a mobile phone and yep. contact somebody. Mm. It was good. It was an art form, basically, I think. You know, some of the skills, you'd see people there, they'd have the headphones on, drink a cup of tea, sending Morse code and having a conversation at the same time with the guy behind you. You know, and it's second nature to some. I couldn't do it, but some of the guys, they've been doing it for 30, 40 years, and they were absolutely immense. Absolutely brilliant to see them in action, and sometimes at busy periods, like Christmas and New Year and everything, there'd be 40 Morse code positions in the same room, and everyone sat there typing away. The noise was fascinating to hear. You retired from this, this role, but yeah. you, you've sort of taken on the role of becoming a local historian for the station. Yeah, uh, BT weren't very good at their heritage side of things. Uh, the station closed in 2000, and in the afternoon of the closing day, the engineers were in dismantling it and basically skipping everything. You know, I thought, this, this, this can't be right. So I managed to sort of purloin a lot of equipment, which I still use. And then there was all the paperwork going back, right back to the 1930s. And this has got to be kept. So I rang the BT archives and managed to get a secondment to them. And for six months, I spent all my time collecting all the historical information I could. Uh, then passed to the archives. Some stuff they didn't want, which I kept for my own use. And uh, it's such an important part of the local history scene. You know, people don't realise how important the station was. Mm. You know, people think of the radio station, oh, I had a great social club, cheap beer, and that was it. <laughs> but it was, you know, the world's largest maritime communication station. You know, and there's nothing left at all to commemorate it. The station was demolished in 2007, a housing estate built on the site. There's nothing there. Absolutely not a brick, not a fence, nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that's what threw me. I mean, I, I first came across across your project because uh, you, you set up a Facebook page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Up until then, um, I'd kept looking around and, and suddenly this Facebook page <laughs> appeared yeah. and I went, how, how have I missed this radio station? And then I started to read more and more and, and realised this is, this is a huge project. Yep. This is, so, so if people want to just, just join the group, if they know somebody or they mm -hmm. had family members, what's the, what's the Facebook page? Right, there's two groups. Uh, one is one for ex-staff only and families, and that contains personal information about people, what they're doing, or anyone who sadly passed away and so on, and it's very in-house. 
uh, that's at uh, just type in Portishead Radio, and that's uh, where you get to the site. The open one, which is for local historians or anyone with an interest in this station, is Portishead Radio GKA, which is the course under the station. Uh, that's open to everyone, although I do check her profiles just to make sure there's nothing untoward or sinister going on. And uh, there is a website, of course, www.portishadradio.co.uk, which is immense, having maybe hundreds of photos of the station, video recordings, audio recordings, a bit of history, and uh, basically, hopefully, everything you want to know about the place. Yeah, I, c- I can certainly agree that the site is huge, and it's yeah. obviously a labour of love, yes. because there's so much information in there, mm. and, and just the historic... I was amazed at the amount of historical video clips yeah. that people have done and posted on, on YouTube, that are, that are now you're able to like combine into one place so you don't have to hunt around for them. Exactly, yes. Uh, one-stop shop, if you like. You know, so if you want information about the station or see a video or hear a recording, it's all there. And, of course, there's other ancillary pages with book reviews and some of the funny events which went on, which uh, can be made public. Some obviously can't. But yeah. uh, there are some which uh, are quite uh, legendary. Would, would uh, you like to share, share one that speaks to mind? There's one. F- uh, there's a nice one. Uh, some of the guys who worked at the station were a little bit eccentric. If you, Great people, wonderful characters. And one day, this guy was taking a telegram, and then all of a sudden, he stood up. And still taking a telegram, and they were looking at him, what's going on? And I said, well, Why are you standing up taking this telegram? And he turned around and said, I am receiving a telegram for, for Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> and of course, the most famous one, which uh, is on the website, is at Christmas, people used to have to book telephone calls to ships and book them days in advance because it was so busy. Ships were limited to maybe a, a half hour slot, which had to be booked in advance. So one Christmas morning, we received a call from the chairman of Cunard, who would like to book a call to the QE2. And in typical radio officer parlance, we said, sorry, you can't have the call. The QE2 is fully booked. To which the caller said, do you know who I am? The usual thing. Um, No, never. Who are you? I am Sir Basil Smallpiece, chairman of Cunard. And the response came, I don't care if you're Basil Brush, you still can't have the call to the ship. A few days later, we received a letter of complaint from the chairman of Cunard, who appreciated that the fact he couldn't have the call, but he wasn't too pleased with being referred to as a, as a furry rodent. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a phrase he used. But um, yeah, there's a few characters in the station, and there were a few uh, interesting episodes, some of which are on the site. So you've you've also written books, you've given mm-hmm. talks, and you must have an Im- immense collection. Is, is it all self-generated, or is it stuff that you've gathered from other people? Uh, a bit of both. Uh, as I said, when the station closed, I basically tried to salvage everything I could. So I've got boxes of stuff upstairs in the attic and folders and so on. Uh, a lot of people knew I collected it, so they were kind enough to let me have stuff. And... Uh, they sent me videos, I've got CDs of recordings and so on. Loads of photographs. The BT archives have been superb in letting me have access to their stuff. Obviously, I did work for them for a time, which helped. Mm-hmm. And also through Facebook, lots of radio officers around the world, they're happy to send me stuff, stories and everything, uh, which culminated a few years ago when people said, why don't you write a book about it? So I did. COVID came. We were all locked down, so that was my COVID project. <laughs> so... Uh, The book had been prepared for a few years before, so I resurrected my documents and archive stuff, finished it off and sent it off, checked it out, and in 2000, or 2000, yeah, 2020, the book was published. Porter said radio, a friendly voice on many a dark night. Oh, that's an excellent title. Yeah, that was given to us by our former station manager, a lovely guy called Ernie Croskill, who some people may remember, and he always referred to it as a friendly voice on many a dark night. I thought that'd be a perfect title for a book. So the history is in there. It's on Amazon if you want to buy it, and also available on the website as well. Oh, excellent. Porter said radio, OK. Yeah. And, and if they want to find out more information, as you say, it's all on the website as well. In, as well. There's a few more information, or a few more bits of information in the book, all about the station. And that led me on to write another book, which is about the smaller stations around the UK. Mm-hmm. Now, Porter said was worldwide. It commu- communicated all over the world, but not around the UK coast. It was too close. So the post office had a network of stations at Land's End, Knighton, North Forland, Humber, all around the coast. And their main job was to, to communicate with ships up to 250 miles away. 
and I've combined a history of their, their uh, operations in one rather immense book, over 500 pages, <laughs> and it's called All Ships, All Ships, which oh. was the uh, phrase used when calling ships over the radio. All right. ships, all ships, this is night and radio, and so on. And to remind the listeners again, the, the website to be able to find links to all this sort of stuff yep. is... It's uh, www.portishadradio.co.uk and it's also available on, on Amazon. But if you want uh, one of the very, uh, not very rare signed copies, that's through the, through the website. Absolutely. <laughs> so do you run the whole website yourself? Is it just, just you? It's just me, yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> again, a labour of love. I mean, having re- retired, there is a bit more time, not a lot. <laughs> But it does need updating a little bit. It's a little bit uh, out of date on some pages, but it's on my list of things to do, time permitting. The, the website of that, is it something that you... Have you always messed around with websites, or is this another skill you had to learn? Not really. It's uh, the, the original website was set up in about 2005, and when it was hosted by BT. And BT stopped hosting websites a few years back, so yes. the, the site went dormant for a few years, and I resurrected it with... Uh, a uh, bit of financial help, but uh, we got it back on the uh, on the internet again, and it's it's thriving. Really, is thriving. Good reviews, and uh, we were getting 100, 150 hits a day wow. all over the world. And I, I noticed the Facebook page as well is very active. There's lots of comments and people having mm. conversations just about odd stories that are being told. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's not only is it uh, radio officers or staff members contribute to the site it's local people as well who remember the station or their father worked there or their neighbor worked there and it's bringing it back to life which is the whole point it's been closed 22 years now coming up and uh but it still it still lives on the internet what are the plans for the future what what what, what are you hoping to try and do right the most obvious thing we'd love to do is to get the station remembered on the site there is money available uh, the builders donated i think a sum of around about fifteen thousand pounds for something the original plan was to have an obelisk or a memorial on site that changed but there is a dispute between the developers and the county council so until the council have full ownership they can't do anything Mm -hmm. i've seen the plans they want to put some sort of aerial shaped climbing frame which is uh, but what i do want is some sort of plaque there and also an information board Mm -hmm. which gives the history of the station and maybe a few benches with plaques on remembering the staff who worked there. But until we get that sorted, we're, we're stuck. And it would be lovely to have some sort of museum as well. Yes. <laughs> Just to clear my attic, if nothing else. So. <laughs> but uh, the Americans are big in museums. The Germans have a station. The German station at Nordijk converted their old building into a museum. The Dutch have a museum. Uh, even Ilfracum has a museum with an old Ilfracum radio console. Highbridge has nothing. Absolutely nothing. Even the names of the roads on, on, on the station site have a very tenuous link with radio. We've got Marconi Drive, which is fair enough, and Tesla, but Suzini and Stockley and Maritime Walk, it's all very vague. We did suggest that we'd call the station something along the lines, or uh, call the development something along the lines of Telegraph Park, with all the names of the co-stations, Night and Way, North Holland, Walk, Portishead Drive, things like that, but mm-hmm. uh, you can't talk. Once the developers made their minds up, they're not for changing. Yeah. Which is a shame, because it, a shame, as you yeah. say, it, it, it stamps the, the heritage and history on mm-hmm. a location, as opposed to people just saying, it used to be here, and there's, there's no evidence. Exactly, yeah. It's, uh, it needs something. I know the BBC did a, an interview years ago, back in the 90s, when they went around Highbridge, asking people, you know, what do you know what the station does? Nobody did, even then, when it was operating. Hmm. You know, people thought it was, you know, something really secretive and GCHQ. It's not. It's fully public. You can pick up any radio list in the road, and it's all there, all the frequencies. Obviously, you weren't allowed to listen to it, but uh, only with special dispensation. But people did. So do, do you remember Highbridge back the period that you were there? So during the 80s period, yep. do, do you... Do you, do you have fond memories of Highbridge Town? Is there anything that stands out that... Mm, it was a thriving place, you know. It was a lot of industry there. Woodbury and Haynes, of course. Uh, the railway station, I remember sitting in the waiting rooms down there, the original buildings. And it was yeah, a nice warm station. There was there was more of a community there. There's more shops, there's more facilities there. And there's more of a community. These days it's just flats and 
houses, there's nothing there. I don't know why that is. Hopefully things will change in the future, but it's become a sprawling suburb of Burnham, if you like, these days. Yeah, the, the, the people I speak to, it, it becomes um, very evident that it, it feels as though it's an, an, an appendage of Burnham. Yeah, very much and, so, yeah. And that people have forgotten, no, it's got its own history, its own catalogue of events. And oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly the railway, it was uh, immense in the sort of uh, early 1900s, 1920s. But sadly, after Beeching, that uh, sort of fell away rather. But, you know, some of the industry there and Highbridge Wharf, you know, there's ships, ships in Highbridge. You know, people don't understand that now. But, of mm -hmm. course, the main thing, my interest is, is the radio station, which, you know, you know, formed a massive part of the community. You know, 250, 300 people work there. And it should be commemorated somehow, some way, but uh, sadly it isn't. Well, well, hopefully somebody that <laughs> hears the podcast may may think, oh, I, I could help with this. I Please. Think something I can do. Yeah, I know we're in touch with the local heritage group and uh, the local history society, and they've been brilliant. But it's just getting you know, pe people with influence on side. You know, I've managed to get our local MP involved in the radio station side of things, and he's has to be kept informed. But, you know, the history group needs a push to get some location somewhere for some sort of museum or exhibition somewhere to uh, to recognise the place. Otherwise, to a lot of people, it's a place you go through on the E38. But mm -hmm. there's, there's so much more to it, so much more. Larry, that's a perfect way to finish our conversation. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for your time and every success with the book, thank you. the website, and hopefully getting some recognition of the the, the site mm -hmm. and where it was. Oh, thank That would be wonderful if we could. I could sleep easy then. The High Bridge Podcast, available on many popular podcast directories, distributed as the High Bridge Podcast on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Podcast Google, Amazon Music, and TuneIn.com. It can also be found at SedgemoreMedia.com and is hosted and found at HighBridgePodcast.transistor.fm also available on your smart speakers. Just say the wait word to the speaker and say clearly, play the Highbridge podcast. <laughs>